I am Judge Catherine Moore, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to King County Superior Court's inaugural Women's History Month event. It seems only fitting that the topic of our first Women's History Month presentation is the long stroke for women's equality and the Equal Rights Amendment. But before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to welcome Alicia Luke. Ms. Luke is the Project Program Manager in the King County Superior Court Clerk Office. Her family are members of the Shimshin Tribe in Alaska, and she has graciously offered to open the program with a land acknowledgement. If you would please give your attention to Ms. Luke. Judge Moore, Ms. Luke is running a little bit late. We will uh, do the acknowledgement a little later in the program. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Right. Well, um, by the, we'll move on then. So, um, by the magic of Zoom, our keynote speaker is joining us from Washington, D.C. We are very fortunate to have Bettina Hager with us today. Ms. Hager is Washington, D.C. co-director of the Fund for Women's Equality, which is the educational arm of the ERA coalition. She has generously agreed to speak with us about the ERA, its past, its present, and its future. She has been actively involved in reinvigorating the effort to pass the 28th Amendment, and she knows all things ERA. After her presentation, we will have a question and answer period, and we hope for a lively discussion. So without further ado, I welcome Tina Hager. Thank you so much, Judge Moore. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with uh, King County Superior Court as we celebrate the end and uh, the finality of what has been a really exciting Women's History Month for the ERA. Um, I thought I'd start with a short video from PBS entitled From Women's Suffrage to the ERA to help us set up the conversation. It gives some great history and brings us up to today. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys. So I'm going to share my screen and, and bring that up now. For the women of Virginia and the women of America, the resolution has finally passed. Last January, Virginia became the latest state to ratify a constitutional amendment that the country has been fighting about for nearly 100 years, the Equal Rights Amendment. But the move quickly drew challenges. Five Republican attorneys general are seeking to block an effort to see the Equal Rights Amendment adopted into the U.S. Constitution. The heart of the ERA is only 24 words. It would bar discrimination on the basis of sex. And the story of its long, circuitous path illustrates the changing debate in America about women's rights. Most dramatic step to date in women's campaign for equal rights. In 1920, women had just secured the right to vote. Women in Illinois are quick to register and vote, while energetic suffrage adherents realize their long campaign is over. The struggle for suffrage had taken decades, and the final few years had pushed leaders like Alice Paul a founder of the National Women's Party, to take radical steps for the cause. Miss Paul, a dramatic campaigner, had gone on a hunger strike earlier in an effort to force congressional action. But for Paul, winning the vote was just the beginning. Many states had laws that made it difficult for married women to work. Uh, if married women worked, they didn't necessarily own their own earnings, and they didn't have the same rights as husbands and fathers over their own children. So they thought that if they had a constitutional amendment that made discrimination against women uh, illegal and unconstitutional, that would be a huge step towards women actually being equal in society. Paul and her collaborators proposed what became known as the Equal Rights Amendment, and it was first introduced into Congress in 1923. But the seemingly straightforward idea raised concerns for many of the women who had worked together for suffrage. They were worried that it would wipe out laws that they had worked hard to get on the books to actually protect women in the workplace. America at the turn of the century. On the assembly line, as in the home, a woman's work is never done. Those special protections for women, like shorter workdays, were hard won by progressive reformers like Florence Kelly, and based on the idea that women, particularly vulnerable to exploitation, needed to be treated differently. 
The reformers and labor unions feared these protections would be undercut by an amendment guaranteeing equality of the sexes. That fear was not unreasonable because the Supreme Court did strike down a law that guaranteed minimum wages for women. They pointed to the fact that women now had the constitutional right to vote as evidence that sex inequality was on its way out. But for people like Alice Paul, special labor protections for one gender were at odds with the idea of equality. Well, we kept saying, but we stand for equality and your special labor laws are not in harmony with the principle that we're standing for. Mm. It was a debate that would follow the ERA through time as women entered the workforce in increasing numbers. Employers find that women can do many jobs as well as men. Some jobs better. And Alice Paul and the National Women's Party continued to press their case for the ERA over the next four decades. Surrounded by memories of suffragettes, these ladies have pursued the goal of a fair and equal break for American women. By the early 1970s, labor opposition to the ERA was receding, in part because labor protections were expanding for both women and men. And with growing bipartisan support in Congress and momentum from the burgeoning women's movement. Equal rights to have a job, to have respect, to not be viewed as a piece of meat. The calls for the ERA were becoming too powerful to ignore. Gradually, instead of a little tiny cluster, we now have 10 million women backing this particular measure before Congress. We will settle for nothing less in the ultimate than equal representation in all levels of political power. Congresswoman Martha Griffiths had repeatedly introduced the ERA into the House over the years and finally succeeded in forcing the amendment onto the floor in 1970, where the broad backing for the measure soon became clear. Once it did get a full debate, well over 90 percent of the House actually voted for the ERA. The House today, by the overwhelming vote of 354 to 23, passed a proposed constitutional amendment to guarantee equal rights for women. By 1972, both the House and the Senate had passed the ERA. The agreement now goes to the states and must be ratified by 38 of them. And within one year, 30 states out of the 38 needed ratified it. But then an opposition movement emerged, led by conservative Phyllis Schlafly. The wife has the legal right to be a full-time wife and mother supported by her husband. The campaign found a receptive audience among women concerned about changing gender roles. The major objection to the Equal Rights Amendment is that it would take away from women rights and privileges which they now have. Schlafly's push dovetailed with the rise of the powerful religious right, and ERA proponents were stunned. The women here now fear they are facing an organized enemy, the moral majority and conservative groups who have found a newly powerful voice since the 1980 election. In the end, the amendment fell three states short when the ratification period expired in 1982. The chimes strike at midnight for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. At that moment, the ERA becomes DOA. But now, over three decades later, as the number of women in Congress and state houses reaches a record high, a new generation is reviving the ERA. There is only one way to spell equality, and that is simply E R A. Women in the Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia legislatures are leading the fight. In the wake of the Me Too movement and the fight for equal pay, the ERA came back to life. What do we want? Equal rights! When do we want it now? Democrats in Congress are pushing for its addition to the Constitution. The House of Representatives voted to remove the 1982 deadline. But Senate Republicans and the Trump administration remain opposed. And there's also the question of the five states that have tried to rescind their ratifications of the amendment. Ongoing litigation makes it unclear when or if it will be added. Today, a century after the ERA was first conceived, it continues to hang in limbo. Over the decades, women have made gains through other changes in laws and policies. But the need for ratification remains for many of the women at the center of the struggle now as a way to recognize the work that's come before and to ensure women's rights going forward. When you enshrine my constitutional rights as a human being equal to men, well, that is the only thing that's acceptable. Persistence, faith, and hope fuel the indomitable spirit of this movement. We got tired but we did not faint. We became weary, but we did not stop. History demands that we take a stand. The struggle continues and the work is not done.
Thank you. Um, we're going to take this brief moment before we launch into an initial conversation to welcome uh, Alicia Luke. Um, as I was saying, Ms. Luke is a, pro a project program manager in King County Clerk's Office, and her family are members of the Shinshigam tribe in Alaska. And she is going to open or mid program uh, the land acknowledgement, which is important to have at any moment. So please give your attention to Ms. Luke. Thank you, Judge Moore. Hello, everyone. Um, before we continue, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the land, on the homeland, excuse me, of Chief Seattle's Duwamish tribe, the first people of Seattle, who have stewarded this land for generations. Oops, excuse me, sorry, I'm having computer issues today. <laughs> um, <clears throat> acknowledging native land shows recognition of and respect for the indigenous people and ways of life and begins to shine a light on histories untold. So together, let us honor the Duwamish people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. I ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here today. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, that opportunity to recognize and to thank the original caretakers of the land upon which King County Superior Court sits. And with that, I'll turn it over again to Ms. Tater. Thank you so much, Judge Moore, and thank you, Ms. Luke, for, for that beautiful land acknowledgement. Um, as uh, I hope everyone enjoyed short film from PBS. I think it really does a great job of highlighting the history of the ERA, which is long and actually quite storied. This is a campaign that has lasted nearly 100 years and continues to move forward. It's truly as the title of this presentation is Unfinished Business. But it also highlights, in my opinion, the continued relevance of this issue that, so, that women and men and and people of all genders have been willing to devote their lives to this mission over so many generations. Which is, I'll be honest, not to say that the campaign has been consistently prominent, but as in many movements has come in waves. And there was actually a long period between um, action in different stages of the ER, fight for the ERA. Um, as we saw the from the first introduction to passage in Congress took nearly 50 years. And we are continuing now into the second 50 years of trying to, to finish the unfinished business. Um, and I think a lot of these waves have and continue to be a result of discussions um, of what equality means and what it looks like for where we and at the different times have been in our society. Just to recap some highlights of the time markers for the ERA and where it's led to us now, um, I just want to go over a few of those dates so that we can set it up. Uh, as I mentioned, and as the video mentioned, in 1923, the ERA was first introduced by, famously by the author, was uh, suffragist Alice Paul, who had recently come off of a successful fight for the 19th Amendment to make sure that there's no discrimination on the basis of sex and voting rights. 50 years later, and during that time, you know, as I know, there was a lot of discussion about what equality means and what what how it affects women. And a lot of the opposition was by, as I noted, the labor um, the labor movement, which was worried about special protections that were meant to protect women and what it would mean if the ERA was in place. But by the 1970s, after the civil rights movement, which had really led um, all that activism had led to the women's movement. Many women were involved and were inspired by the work of the civil rights movement. By the 1970s, 1972, the ERA had gained an immense amount of social favor and passed through Congress with the required two thirds vote in both chambers. But it did have a seven year time limit in the preamble. Um, as an aside, this seven year time limit was not originally supported or wanted by advocates, but was a concession to Southern Democrats um, in the Senate uh, who were opposing the ERA for states' rights issues. 
um, this is the, the, uh, the actual origination of time limits is not in the Constitution. It came about, interestingly enough, with the Prohibition Amendment, um, and in a way was, was first put on in hopes to keep an amendment from being ratified. The history behind that was that uh, there was so much support for the temperance movement and so much support for prohibition that the senators felt extreme pressure to pass it. However, they were hoping they could continue to drink their alcohol. So they put a seven year time limit thinking, okay, well, this isn't gonna pass. It's not gonna gain the movement. They were wrong, it did. <laughs> and you know, the, not the next, but the, after that, we saw the only time a constitutional amendment has been revoked um, with the overturning of the Prohibition Amendment. So that's, I think that's an interesting um, history to have in mind when we even look at why we have time limits on amendments. And there were two amendments that didn't have time limits, the first being the 19th Amendment, which was suffrage, and then the Child Labor Amendment, which um, didn't actually need to, be, didn't need to be implemented. But both of those were considered to be such uh, fundamental human rights issues that they shouldn't have time limits on it because you shouldn't be putting a time limit on a human rights issue. Proponents of the ERA felt that this was similar and that there shouldn't be a time limit. But in order to get it passed, they thought, we'll compromise. There's so much support. There's no way this won't get done. It'll get done in a year or two. The person who didn't feel this way, interestingly enough, was Alice Paul. And a really interesting story was, uh, I have a friend and colleague, Elise Smeal, who is the president of the Feminist Majority and has been working on this for a very long time. She was there the day that it passed in 1972. And when, they, when it passed, she went back to the house of the National Women's Party where Alice Paul still lived. And they found her crying at the Susan B. Anthony's desk. And they thought, okay, well, these must be tears of joy. However, when they talked to her, they quickly realized that they weren't. And what she was saying was the ERA is doomed. It'll never be ratified. They'll give us almost to there and then it won't make it. And they thought originally, oh, she's an older lady, she's pessimistic, but in, in reality, she was right. And that's, that's what we saw happen. Um, so by 1978, 35 of the 38 necessary states had ratified. They realized that the time limit was about to expire and they didn't have the last three. So they passed an extension bill for another three years, some six months and a few days, which again, I've been told was strategic because it didn't give the state legislatures enough time to have votes and to change the makeup to have uh, pro-equality legislatures where they would have gotten those three other states. By the time of the expiration of the second deadline in 1982, no additional states ratified and it expired. Since 1982, at least one former strategy of the ERA has been introduced in every congressional session. And I like to point this being especially remarkable because prior to 1972, an ERA was introduced in every session since 1923. So since 1923, other than when the ERA is in front of the states, every single congressional session has introduced an ERA. I don't know if there are records, but I feel like that might break one. So for the past hundred years, every congressional session has introduced an ERA. And where there's a new movement for the ERA kind of began in 1992, when the 27th Amendment, the Madison Amendment, was ratified after a 202-year campaign. It was originally proposed by Madison to be part of the Bill of Rights, um, but he proposed 12 and they only had 10. So this one seems to have gotten cut. And what happened was the Madison's Amendment ratification led some law students to hypothesize that if the Madison Amendment was considered sufficiently contemporaneous, so should the ERA. And at that point, it had only been 20 years since the ERA has passed through Congress, not 202. Um, and a new strategy was born. It was originally called the three-state strategy. Um, now it's, called, it's not called that because there are no states since we've had three states ratify since. Um, and there had been continued to be women in these unratified states pushing for ratification since the 1982 deadline. And what this really did was give a new breath of life to the movement for ratification. And this is where most of the advocacy has been of late. So for decades, women have been pushing in states, mostly unknown because there just wasn't the attention being paid. 
But in 2016, that election really created an uprising of support for women's rights. There was the Women's March, there was Me Too movement, and there was just became renewed momentum for the ERA and moving forward women's policies in general. So one state that hadn't ratified prior was Nevada. And after the 26th election, they actually had a record number of women in their legislature. On March 22nd, 2017, 45 years to the date of when the ERA passed out of Congress, Nevada became the 36th state to ratify. In 2018, Illinois followed suit. And in 2020, Virginia voted to become the 38th state to ratify, which under what the Constitution originally laid out in Article 5, it, uh, it satisfies the requirements for a constitutional amendment to be ratified and adopted into the US Constitution. Because it had passed two thirds of the House and Senate and been ratified by three quarters of the states. When the archivist, so the archivist is the one who receives the ratifications and take notes, takes note, it's kind of like a glorified librarian. And when he received the 38th state amendment, he reached out to the then Trump administration's Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel to ask their opinion on what to do, because he had technically gotten 38 state ratifications. That's what the Constitution says to do, but there was this time limit, which is different than the Madison Amendment, which did not have a time limit. As I noted, the first time limit was with the 18th Amendment with prohibition. So there was an instruction not to publish, um, which if you read the memo from the OLC is actually quite political, it's not just legal, and was in the opposite of the precedents that had been set when they were looking at the 1978 extension bill. So as a result, the attorneys general of Virginia, Illinois, and Nevada have filed a lawsuit compelling him to publish. It was just recently, unfortunately dismissed because of lack of standing because they haven't been, been able to prove because of the assertion that the archivist's job is merely ministerial, um, that, his that his unwillingness to publish was a harm that they experienced. Um, however, it didn't touch upon whether or not Congress was able to remove a deadline. And they specifically noted they were not addressing that question. So we do continue to hope that the new Department of Justice will revoke the memo, going back to its previous precedents, allowing the archivist to go ahead and do his job and publish. So that's one of the, the hopes that activists have right now, is that if you can publish this amendment, it's actually much harder, I think, from a social perspective to argue in front of the Supreme Court or to anyone, well, let's take it out of the Constitution. Um, so that, that is one strategy that advocates are pushing forth because the, the, all of the requirements under Article 5 have been met. Meanwhile, in Congress, a set of joint resolutions have been introduced, which would effectively ask Congress to vote to remove the time limit from the ERA. The bills in the House were introduced by Representative Jackie Speer and by, in the Senate by co-lead bipartisan sponsor, Senators Carter and Murkowski in the Senate. So in February of 2020, the House voted for the first time to pass this resolution. Um, it was the first official hearing on the ERA in 36 or 37 years. And this month on March 17th, um, in honor of Women's History Month, the House voted again uh, to pass this resolution in the new session. It's a bipartisan vote, strongly favored by the Democrats' entire caucus and, and some Republicans. So right now, we're currently working to get the support of 60 senators, which is needed to break the filibuster. In the last session, we had the full Democratic caucus plus Senators Murkowski and Collins, so we had 52. And we believe if Congress is able to vote on a deadline, it can vote off a deadline, which was in the preamble and not actually the amendment language. So what would the ERI mean and do? And why are people been fighting for it for 100 years? Well, adoption of the ERA would finally provide an explicit guarantee of protection against discrimination on the basis of sex in the US Constitution. It would make a criti critically important statement about equality. Since the Constitution reflects our most cherished values as a nation, 
putting sex equality in the Constitution will have broad impacts on all aspects of our society. It would be a, a particularly important message to children who are growing up in a world that is more diverse and bring the United States up to par with the rest of the world. Most developed nations and all new constitutions adopted in the world since World War II provide some kind of equal rights guaranteed on the basis of sex. It would provide additional tools to protect against sex-based violence and discrimination in the enforcement of laws and legislation, and it would provide additional tools to combat discrimination in government employment, including in education, law enforcement, and the military. And I just want to touch on a little bit on the 14th Amendment, because a lot of what we're asked is, how is this different from the 14th Amendment? Don't women already have these rights? Why do we need this? And under the current cases, the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause does give some protection against sex discrimination, but not as much as race discrimination. So the level of which women are protected under the 14th Amendment, um, or anyone is protected in the 14th Amendment uh, uh, um, against discrimination on the basis of sex is at intermediate scrutiny rather than strict scrutiny, which was kind of a category created specifically for women. Um, so the, the burden of proof on the victim is much higher, which makes it harder to, to win your case. So, and even those cases can be in question. Um, some justices, and we have quite a few on the, on the Supreme Court now, who are constitutional originalists, uh, believe that the 14th Amendment should not apply to sex at all because its authors did not have sex equality in mind. Um, to quote the Antonin Scalia, certainly the Constitution does not require discrimination on the basis of sex. The only issue is whether it prohibits it. It doesn't. Another aspect of the ERA that's important to understand is the level of societal change and um, that it will give to this country. It is an important legal tool, but it's almost equally important as a statement of principle and empowerment. There's been a lot more attention paid to the history of the uh, brilliant legal scholar Polly Murray recently and black women throughout the ERA fight has been recently uplifted. Julie Souk, who's an ERA legal scholar, wrote an article examining Murray's Senate testimony in 1970 where she asserts that the ERA will have the greatest impact on black women who face both race and sex discrimination. And this is actually true for all women of color. Um, Murray stated in her testimony that black women as a group had the most to gain from the adoption of the Equal Rights Amendment because, I'm quoting, implicit in the amendment's guarantee of equal rights without regard to sex is the constitutional recognition of personal dignity which transcends gender. And this is a large part of the renewed movement for the ERA and, discussion, and the discussion around what equality in today's society looks like. They mentioned at the beginning, I do feel a lot of times waves of support for social justice movements come as with, with questions and with discussions around what equality looks like in our society. And equality based on sex, race, class cannot be divided. Um, the ratifications of the last three states were largely driven and championed by Black women, continuing and reinforcing Murray's legacy. Uh, Senator Pat Spearman in Nevada, Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton in Illinois, Delegate Jennifer Carol Foy and Senator Jennifer McClellan in Virginia. These are the women who brought us across the finish line. Um, and we've been honored to continue work with them in this fight. So the Fund for Women's Equality of which I'm the DC Director and Director of Outreach and Advocacy is continuing the work of our sister organization, the ERA Coalition, which does most of our lobbying work, um, but looking at it from a educational and implementation um, point of view. Some of the work that we're currently doing to prepare for when the ERA is adopted includes creating a corporate council, um, where we're actually recruiting businesses to come in and support our work um, and to take a pledge to change the culture within their business to really support what the ERA is asking of uh, society. We're also looking at ways 
that we can educate the public, officials, government, about how policies and changes need to be made. Um, the, the, we have a, a great group in Arizona who, not for fun, I don't want to say for fun, but what, but they decided to take a review of all of the statutes and laws in the state, in their state constitution, their state bills, um, and review them and see, you know, not for fun, but kind of for fun, what would need to change if there was an Equal Rights Amendment. And it's actually a 692 page document of changes that would need to be done from the most basic of the fact that all of the language in their state laws is sex, um, it's not sex neutral. It's all gendered, doctors are men, firefighters are men, um, architects are men, to some laws that are actually looking in a more substantive, substantive way um, around parental rights, around marriage, um, around health care. So when we look at what it would actually do, it would, part of the ERA asks governments, or gives two years theoretically, for the federal and state government to look at their laws, review their laws, and make those changes. And if we found 692 pages in one state alone, we can only imagine how many it would be across the nation and even within our federal government um, to, to really guarantee equality on, on the basis of sex as a lived principle in this country. Um, so I do feel like I've talked quite a bit and I would love to hear from the audience, receive any questions that there are, um, judge more if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. And, and I just wanted to open up from that. All right. Well, thank you very much for that great overview. Um, I'll just start it out, and hopefully we'll get some questions from the um, uh, participants. So one thing that you had mentioned was that if it were uh, passed, the, the sort of concrete impacts you talked about, it would uh, help with uh, uh, dealing with sex-based violence. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Sure. Well, so the same day that the ERA was passed in the House of Representatives, the Violence Against Women Act was passed in the House of Representatives, which we felt was very fortuitous. Um, so the Violence Against Women Act has in the past um, has in the past had some some challenges to its constitutionality. The Violence Against Women Act is actually based off of protections under the Commerce Clause. And there was one protection um, that was uh, used to give more of a private right of action. And the case was challenged after a young co-ed woman had been raped on campus. And she had sued her college for not, um, for not you know, prosecuting or taking seriously uh, this uh, this the her case and and what the action that had been taken against her under the Violence Against Women Act's uh, private right of action, and she took it all the way to the Supreme Court, and it was struck down. And the feeling and the reasoning being not that she couldn't have won her case; she had a fair case. What she was proving was right. She was discriminated on the basis of sex. She had definitely suffered, um, you know. She had suffered against her constitutional rights, but they said that there was no constitutional basis for this and that we were stretching the Commerce Clause far too far um, in, in the Violence Against Women Act, and they actually struck down her case and they struck down the entire provision. Um, so that's one of the, the places where we feel if we had an Equal Rights Amendment, we would be able to provide a constitutional backing for these types of laws and for these types of protections that women currently don't have. Additionally, there was a case uh, by actually a good friend of mine, uh, Jessica Lenahan, where her, she had a restraining order against her husband or ex-husband at that point. And they had three children together. And the three children um, at one point were abducted by their father. And their mother called and said, and, and complained to the police, I have a restraining order. Um, I need you to enforce it. My husband has my three daughters. There's a reason I have the restraining order. And the police decided that they wouldn't enforce it. And they said, 
It's their father. They'll be fine. They'll come back. So after many, many calls and many, many um, visits that she had to the police, um, he did finally show up at the police station. And what they found in the back of his truck after he had a standoff with the police were her three daughters who had been murdered. So she also sued the police department saying that this was a violation of her constitutional rights to have this restraining order enforced. Um, and it went all the way to Supreme Court. Yet again, they said there was no constitutional basis for this protection, um, that the restraining order was actually discretionary and not mandatory. And so she went to the International Human Rights Court, brought her case in front of them, and won on language. It was basically the equivalent of the Equal Rights Amendment. So again, in all of these cases, we feel like women are being told there's no constitutional basis for their complaints against their constitutional rights to be protected against violence, and the ERA would provide that. So that's where we're hoping to make some progress. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, we've gotten quite a few number of really wonderful questions. Um, the first one, I'll just take them in order, is would the ERA provide protections to all women, including transgender women? Yes, we do believe that it would, um, especially considering the recent Bostock decision, which um, was actually was looking at Title VII over the summer um, and evaluating whether the protections for, against sex discrimination would include those um, for transgender people um, and for LGBT, the LGBT population. And they did decide that, yes, the protections do extend from sex discrimination. This is a prohibition against sex discrimination at the constitutional level. Um, so it would only strengthen that. And, you know, and, um, and it would protect anyone who has a sex, which is the entire population. It would protect women, it would protect men, it would protect transgender women, transgender men. Um, we focus on women because women have historically been the ones discriminated on the basis of sex. However, it's not exclusively for women and especially cisgendered women. Um, so in reality, it would, it would provide protections for everyone. Thank you. What uh, ERA ratific What would the ERA ratification impact be for Roe v. Roe v. Wade? So that is a little bit more complicated, just because we don't have the same case law that we do, um, like with the Bostock decision. Um, Roe v. Wade was just, you know, as you know, was decided under privacy, which is would be a separate argument, and. Um, on the basis of sex. Um, so that would, I think, need to have a different set of legal precedents. We do know that we have a lot of advocates who are hoping to use the ERA, um, especially as Roe v. Wade is attacked, um, to create that sort of legal precedence of saying that those protections should fall under sex equality or um, discrimination against the basis of sex. Um, there have been Many cases in the states where they've where they've tried to use that, there have been a few that have been successful. There actually have been quite a few that have not been successful. Um, so it, it's more of an unknown, but I do know that there are groups who would like to see that and, and will be trying to use it once, knock on wood, it's adopted. So. Thank you. Um, so along those lines, can you provide a specific example of a legal protection that would be provided to women, um, however we define it, um, under the ERA that doesn't currently exist under current law? That doesn't currently exist? I, I do, I think that, um, you know, as as has been stated before, that the 14th Amendment does pro does provide some form of discrimination, uh, protection against discrimination on the basis of sex. This would just be a stronger level of, um, it would be a much stronger way of addressing that. There are some areas where people feel that this would be able to provide it because of that stronger le level of protection. 
Um, currently, pregnancy discrimination, that went up to the Supreme Court. That was found not to be sex discrimination. And there are many lawyers, uh, litigators, who feel under an ERA that that would be, that they would be able to win the argument that pregnancy discrimination should be looked at as sex discrimination. Um, there are there are certain cases that have been, you know, the same thing with the Violence Against Women Act um, that I mentioned earlier, with the restraining order that I mentioned earlier. It's not necessarily that people haven't tried in many of these cases, it's that they haven't succeeded. And this is a tool that would help women succeed. Additionally, I think that it provides an opportunity to think bigger. Um, so we have cases that we've tried to win, but what are the cases that we haven't thought of? Um, you know, what about areas in childcare? Or, and we, maybe we have thought about them, but but we haven't looked at it or, or fought for it under sex discrimination or, um, or for, um, for, you know, as I said, anything re related to maternity care, um, how could it be used for maternal leave? We're one of, I think, three countries that doesn't provide any sort of maternity, paid maternity leave. Um, currently, that's, I don't know that, the, I don't, to my best of my knowledge, that's not being pursued, but it could be. So I think that another thing that the ERA brings is this new level for creativity. I remember when, shortly after Virginia, or when Virginia was about to pass, um, I'd constantly been thinking about how do you pass the ERA? But then I started to think about, okay, well, this could actually happen. What would that mean? You know, and how could we use this even in a new way? And I think that there'll be troves of lawyers thinking about all the ways that we could win cases that we couldn't win, provide protections that don't currently exist that we had tried to win, and then think about new ways that this can be used. And um, it also gives us an opportunity to look at what I like to call is intersectional policy making, um, where a lot of the issues that we've been focusing on are very siloed. We focus on um, violence against women, focus on equal pay, we focus on issues of race discrimination, but again, as a new tool, sometimes new tools open creativity, like how could we create policy that potentially addresses those all in a more holistic way, um, which I would arguably think would be able to address women's issues, especially those who are um, who are facing multiple forms of discrimination better. Thank you. Uh, next question is, in the 1970s, the opposition to the ERA seemed to center around traditional roles concerned with changing gender roles. Since gender roles have changed significantly in the last 50 years and distanced from heteronormative ideals, what does the current opposition center on? You know, the current opposition likes to center on a few. I mean, it, it's actually, a, I think it was Gloria Steinem who made the, who pointed out that it's the best paradox. Um, there's an the argument that it would do not, it wouldn't do anything because you already have the protections. Then there's the argument that it would basically lead to the downturn of all society. So, if it were to do nothing, how would it lead to the downturn of all society? Um, you know, a lot of the arguments that are, are brought up um, are, doesn't the 14th Amendment already provide the protections? Um, some of them are in questions specifically around the procedural aspects of this three state or time limit removal question. Um, there, I've heard that quite a lot. I think that that's actually an easy way to hide behind a, the fear of supporting a prohibition against sex discrimination because it's easier to say, well, I don't think you can do this and to say I don't support it. Um, there are a lot of opponents who try to bring in some of the um, some of the more controversial issues to kind of make it more of a, a wedge issue. Um, so and and play off of people's fears, which we see on many issues. Um, but you know, one thing I, I'd like to point out, though, is that we ha we did see in the 1970s the perception. If you watch Mrs. America, you, there's this idea that it was kind of Phyllis Schlafly leading the way, and traditional 
roles were the reason that that the ERA didn't succeed. But from from what I know of people who were on the ground, they feel that was more of a front. And even kind of all these issues are more of a front because of the impact that it would have economically, um, at least at that time. And now we do have the uh, non-discrimination laws from uh, under the Affordable Care Act. Um, but they would, the insurance companies made a ton of money based off of discriminating on the basis of sex. I think they would charge, I think it was around 150% more, 250% more for women for healthcare coverage under the auspice of, oh, well, women get pregnant. But then if you looked at those policies, they didn't cover maternity leave. So there was a huge economics, there's a huge economic argument by some to make against providing sex equality because it's really good business to be able to charge women more because you want to. Um, and additionally, the businesses, and, and you know, I've heard from, from private off the record conversations people have said to me was, you know, I talked to this business leader, he's a conservative, he's a Republican, he told me, you know, I'm really, I'm really not that concerned about abortion, but, but how much is this gonna cost me? So, there's always been sort of the, the powerful kind of movement behind it, which would be the people with the power and the money, the businesses, the insurance companies. But that's not a very positive thing to say. And so many people think that the Phyllis Schlafly's of the world, the um, this is about gender roles, is more of a front to, to what was the real reasoning behind the opposition against the ERA. And I think that that still continues. It's, you know, what um, Polly Murray said in her testimony, I don't know if it was testimony, I read this great article yesterday, was that the powerful never like to give up their power. And to empower a group means that there are some people who have a disproportionate amount of power that will have to lose some of it. Um, and, and there will always be people who fight that. So I don't know if it's kind of more of a roundabout way, but um, but I do think that that has historically been and probably continues to be a big fear is what what is this going to cost me? So, but what do we have to gain? Thanks. A lot. <laughs> so, and and support and actually, you know, the the statistics don't prove that to be true. The statistics show that. When you have greater diversity in the workplace, you actually make money. It's like a billions, multiple billions, trillion dollar boost to the GDP to have women as more active participants in the labor force, as more active and equal participants in the in society. I think it was a McKinney study. I can't remember. It was hundreds of billions of dollars that it would bring to GDP if you were to um, to to make policies and you were to make the society more equal for women, um, which despite being a industrialized developed country in a lot of the, a lot of the studies, they've shown that there are many ways that America doesn't quite live up to what it could live up to. And, and it would, in diversity, it brings more money to the, to the industry. So I have a, uh, just a question. So we're seeing uh, with COVID and uh, pandemic and people working from home and remotely that we've seen a remarkable drop in the number of women, professional women and women at all levels of the economy having to drop out of the workforce um, to provide for their families, childcare. Um, and that's going to have a very long-term effect on women's uh, economic standing, social standing, and I'm wondering if, if you think about if the if passage of the ERA would have been able would have any effect on that. We definitely believe that the passage of the ERA would have a, a large impact on that. Um, you know, as as I was talking about before, um, it would provide a new tool to combat discrimination, and a lot of that uh, women face is is in workplace discrimination. Um, it would provide a new tool against equal pay, unequal pay, which um, admittedly would start for sure 
in the public sector because the language as written definitely protects against discrimination in the, in the public sector and government. But one of the things um, that people sometimes forget is how large of an employer the government is. Um, there are many government, em government employees, there are many government contractors. It's a huge percentage of our economy. So it wouldn't have a small impact. Um, and it would include you know, government employees, the federal, the state, the local level teachers. You know, it would it would include so many, so many people and who are actually disproportionately women of color, it would provide support for them um, in these in these roles where they disproportionately are employed. It would additionally um, so the so the prohibition against sex discrimination would would do that for unequal pay. I would arguably say it would change, it could change childcare laws, it could change, you know, maternity leave laws. I think one of the things that has been so hard is that despite the advances we've made in society, the burden of childcare still largely falls on women, which is why so many women have been forced to leave the workforce. And I don't have children, but I have many, I have sister-in-laws who do, they have full-time jobs and it's, it just seems, I mean, almost undoable having trying to play, having to have the job of teacher and having to have the job of their full-time job. So hopefully it would lead to better policies around workplace and around the workplace. It would lead to societal change where hopefully um, those roles would become more equal. I think they are becoming more equal, but I don't think that they're quite there yet. So yeah. Well, just to play a little bit of a devil's advocate, what are the cons, if any, to having any rights amendment? For me, I don't think there are cons to having any core rights amendment. There may be people who do think that there are cons, but I don't see how greater equality can be a con. You know, I think that it's, um, I think that it benefits society. I think that it benefits everyone. Um, and having that as a, a as a basic principle of our country and our and the underlying governing document, I think could only make our society a more equal society, which in the end would be a better society. But that's that's what that's my job. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So oh, at the moment, uh, this question is, what, what are the final hurdles to getting this uh, made to be the 28th Amendment? And what can we as uh, citizens do to see that happen? Well, so right now, some of the final hurdles that we have are um, just trying to see, so trying to see it be acknowledged almost as the 28th Amendment. Um, and the, the reasons that people are arguing against it being so are the time limit. Um, some people argue a little about the rescissions, although we feel that there's a pretty strong legal argument that rescissions can't be counted. They haven't been counted in the past and it would lead to just a plethora of legal questions that nobody would wanna open up. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to do to address at least a time limit issue is to get these bills passed through Congress. And right now it's been passed through the House, but we have more difficulty in the Senate. So we're asking citizens to contact. Um, this is separate from the program because I know this is a nonpartisan program. Um, but but as, as advocates, that's what we're asking cons uh, constituents to do is to support these bills that could help remove that barrier and remove ambiguity around whether or not it should be adopted into the constitution. But that is separate from this program, <laughs> just to be clear. Thank yeah. you for that clarification. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and are there any are there any pending lawsuits that would um, to prevent it from being ratified at this point or being adopted, I should say? Well, we haven't yet found 
a lawsuit that has been, none of the lawsuits that have been filed so far have been found to have standing. Um, so there was a lawsuit, the lawsuit that was mentioned in PBS, um, where five attorneys general from states that um, are more conservative haven't ratified we're trying to sue the archi archivist almost preemptively to sue him for to compel him not to publish, but there was nothing that the archivist had done yet for them to prove that they had any standing in their request. Um, you know, there there are some people who think there could be lawsuits. So technically, when Virginia ratified, it, it ratified January 27, 2020. The Equal Rights Amendment has a two-year kind of delay for the seconds clause. It says this will take effect two years after ratification. There are many people who argue about, well, when does ratification count? And um, there are a lot of people who feel January 27, 2020, when Virginia ratified, that that is when the two-year clock started. So there will likely be um, cases of sex discrimination brought to courts January 27, 2022. And it will be women, men, or anyone who's experienced sex discrimination um, bringing these cases, trying to win and say, my rights have been violated under the Equal Rights Amendment. It's theoretically, a lot of people theorize that what will then happen is that the judge will have to make a decision whether or not to uphold the Equal Rights Amendment if they uphold it, they'll likely be sued by someone who's saying you can't uphold it, the Equal Rights Amendment isn't in the Constitution. If they don't uphold it, they will, <laughs> they will likely be appealed saying it is part of the Constitution. So those are some of the lawsuits that we're, we're looking at that will likely happen um, because I can almost guarantee you that as of January 27, 2022, there will be at least one person in court trying to use CRA. So. Interesting. So yeah. uh, we anticipate that the United States Supreme Court will, will determine whether or not the 28th Amendment has been um, made part of the adopted. <laughs> that, the that is Amendment. most likely what will happen. Yes. So we know that the court isn't supposed to be political, but we do think that the incredible social support you know, societal support of this issue would make a difference to the Supreme Court justices. So we are trying to also just raise the awareness of the issue and get it to be a very popular national issue that um, it's shown it's really the will of the people. So. so would that include denying to get it passed in states that have yet to ratify it, even though they're not necessary for the, the 38? We do, we, we have, um, I think, Last year, every single state that was unratified had um, legislation in their most recent session that had been introduced, including um, Alabama for the first time, and I don't even remember how long. So, so there, there are many states that are continuing to pursue ratification, and very actively. In North Carolina has an extremely active movement. South Carolina has an extremely active movement. Utah, um, they all have a harder uphill battle um, because the states are more conservative, but they work so hard. <laughs> they really do, it's inspiring. So they're very passionate that even if it doesn't count that their state should ratify the ERA as a matter of principle. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, our time is up. Is there any, are there any concluding remarks that you'd like to make? I, you know, I, I, I think that I want, well, first I just want to conclude by thanking you and thanking everyone who attended and by saying that this really is an, an important step, an important tool that will be used to strengthen our democracy. And I encourage everyone to talk about this with their friends to build the momentum that we need to show how popular this issue is. And to, to really think about, you know, we've done, we've satisfied all of the requirements to have this become the, an amendment. 
and I was just thinking about how I don't know if most people in the country understand that or know that or are aware of that um, because it, it just seems so unfair that if you've if you've satisfied everything to become the 28th amendment that you shouldn't be in there. So I just wanna thank everyone for their time, for their support, for coming. And, um, and just, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Um, Judge Moore, I don't know if you can provide my contact information or if I should just put it in the chat, but, um, but yeah, but thank you so much. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the court, I want to thank Ms. Pei for an excellent presentation and discussion and very generous donation of your time to educate us about the Equal Rights Amendment and its role in ongoing work for equality. Um, for additional information, there should be a link provided at the at our last screen. Um, and it is a fund for women's equality where you can find um, Ms. Pei and additional information. And then um, I also commend to everyone the Will Smith uh, Amend, the 14th Amendment series on Netflix. It's an excellent uh, review of the 14th Amendment and has very interesting discussions about the intersection between uh, the 14th Amendment and the Equal Rights Amendment and gives, uh, fleshes out the issue of why the ERA is really needed in addition to the 14th Amendment. Um, and then last but not least, I'd like to thank Beth Ehler, Amy Rowe, and Judge Paul Rothrock for their invaluable help in bringing this program to fruition. And on behalf of the Courts and Community Committee, I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. Be well. Thank you. Thank you so much.